I was buried. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. we thank you that you have been the one to take us out of the grave, God, that you are the one who has taken us out into a glorious day that you have given us by your spirit. And God, that is something that is a gift to us, Lord. It's, it's not something that we earned ourselves. And God, we are grateful and thankful for that. And so, God, we honor you and worship you. When we sing, Lord, it's, it's because of what you have done. And so, Lord, we pray that, that you will as we worship, remind us, God, of our need for you. And Lord, it wasn't something that our need for you is not just at the cross, but it's each and every day, God. That, Lord, we would ask that your spirit would come fall on us, Lord, this morning that we would submit ourselves to you. And, Lord, that you would breathe your breath on us, that we might be filled with your spirit and we would hear your voice, God. Fill me with 
God, we thank you for your spirit as a promise that we have each and every day that that you will walk with us. But God, more than that, that you will empower us to live the kind of life that you want us to. God, it is something that we need to come back and, and Lord, constantly just ask you to to come and and to to fill us, God, that we would would have the power, Lord, and, and the courage to live the way you want us to. God, it's because of what you have done for us at the cross that this is even a possibility. And I pray that we would constantly be amazed at what you've done and be reminded of the great sacrifice that you've made for us. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree His body bowed and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. i uh-huh. 
Rose of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. God, thank you that you have, through the grave and your resurrection, overcome death. You, God, you offer us forgiveness of sins. You offer us new life. And you offer us, God, a promise for a future that we cannot earn. There's nothing we can do to, to, to earn that, buy that for ourselves. God, we thank you for that. We pray that, that as we continue to worship, Lord, through prayer, through the word this morning, that we will have that deeply embedded in our hearts. That as a, as a response to all that we just sang about is that we want to take our lives and put them at your feet and say, God, do with them as do with our lives as you want. And I pray that that will be the desire of our heart. Thank you for your great gifts to us, God, because of what you have done through your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask in your precious name. Amen. Well, we're going to be in Luke chapter 22 today. Most of you are not surprised by that. But we're also going to be looking at Matthew and Mark, at least I'm going to refer to it, and I would encourage you to look there at some point in time. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about, and it's Luke 22, 39 through 46, it's the time when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I want to talk to you about the strength of surrender. You know, God works in our lives at the point of our surrender. And, and, and yet I want you to know that we have a very serious vocabulary problem today. I mean, a really serious one. So think about this with me or else you might never get this. Because the word I feel that summarizes best what's happening here in Jesus' life in that garden, his surrendering is, is his surrendering his will to the Father. I think you probably would agree with that. But well, let's face it, in our world, world, the word surrender is considered a negative thing, right? But in God's word, it's often the gateway to great things. We think of surrender as something that happens when you lose, right? When, when success in battle or business is at the point of hopelessness and to continue just means more certain loss of life or, or uh, capital, you surrender. The Bible says that surrender has, uh, is something that has to happen to you before you can win. Uh, and today we're going to see how Jesus surrendered himself to God 
uh, the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, but we're also going to think about what Jesus is calling us to do in laying down our lives in full surrender. Here's what we discover about surrendering ourselves to what God has for us. When we surrender ourselves to him, he will take us to heights where he wants to take us. It's a sweet surrender. Some of us are in this room today and we're really down and at a low place spiritually because we're, we failed to surrender to God fully what he wants, to, to what God wants for us. Listen, every day of our Christian, my Christian life and your Christian life is a fresh opportunity for us to surrender more and more and more to God. And as you surrender yourself to him, he takes you to where he wants you to be. Please remember that. This could be a life-changing message for some people that are here today because this is a point of, of issue in your life that maybe it's a hump that you have not gotten over in some major way, maybe right now in your life. Some of us today need to surrender some bitterness or some unforgiveness from our past so that God can take us to where he wants us to be. Some of us are here today and we need to remember uh, and surrender our own will to God. And that's what Jesus does in this passage as we're going to look at it in just a moment. He surrendered his will to the Father's will. You may be holding on to something. Maybe a dream for your life that isn't coming true. Maybe a plan for your life and it doesn't seem to be unfolding that way. Maybe it's just an attitude that you think this is how things need to be. Uh, for me or someone close to me, and it's not going that way. And ultimately, it's what you will. It's what you want. And today, God is saying to you that he wants you to surrender so that he can take you to where he wants you to be. Surrender is always the pathway to victory in God's kingdom, in the Christian life. It's not something that causes us to lose it causes us to win. It's different. Remember that. And we see that in the life of Jesus on the, here, the night, the night before he, he gave his life for us. He was crucified. He was in a place called uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. So I want you if, you, if you're able to stand with me, we're going to read this passage together, starting in verse 39, going down to verse 46. And then I'd like to share a few things from it. Verse 39, And he came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. May God ask, bless the reading of his word uh, this morning. You may be seated. You know, Luke's record of this event, which we just read, goes along perfectly with similar ones in both Matthew and Mark's gospel. But what we find is this is a shortened account of, of the, the, that night. So I, I want to fill, as we go through the message, I want to fill you in with some of the details that come from Matthew and Mark's gospel. Please go back and check this out later. It, it, it's all perfectly aligned. It's just this is a, a, a shortened one. And, and just a reminder of context. Jesus has just left the upper room. We were there last week in the verses above this, the upper room where he celebrated the Lord's Supper that we just celebrated today and, uh, and had a conversation about greatness and so forth. And so now in, 
It says, it doesn't say it here, but in Matthew and Mark it says he went to a place called Gethsemane, and here it says he went to a place called the Mount of Olives. Well, that's two ways to describe the same thing, so don't get nervous about that. Uh, the Mount of Olives, in, on the Mount of Olives, which is the side of a mountain, was a garden called Gethsemane, okay? Uh, that word Gethsemane simply means olive press. These are, this is a picture of Gethsemane. Uh, they know where it is. Those are olive trees, okay? And uh, it means olive press. And back in these days, back then, this was a place that they had an olive press, and they would take the olives, uh, harvest it from all the trees on the mountain, and bring them there to press them into olive oil. So it's this garden spot. It's a beautiful spot. Even today, it's right across from the Kidron Brook, uh, and uh, just to east of the city. You really can't see it in this picture, but there's a city back there on the other side of the, 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 the brook and the valley, and that's the ancient wall, of the east wall of Jerusalem, so it's quite close, and that's where Jesus was that night. Now, here's what the three Gospels, all three of them, tell happened there. Jesus prayed there, right? Not just one time, not just two times, but three times. We don't see that all in Luke, but Mark tells us that. Three times, over and over again, each time he prayed the same exact prayer, or at least what's given to us, I'll explain that in a minute. We read it in verse 42. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Three times. The words of that prayer, that's a very short prayer. It takes about, it's 20 words, it takes about 10 seconds to pray, okay? And uh, it's recorded in Matthew and Mark the same way. Um, now, obviously, this wasn't all Jesus prayed when he prayed those three times. He spent time before the Father in prayer, time enough at least for the disciples to fall asleep, right? And uh, so these words were not all the words Jesus prayed in those times of prayer, but I think they represent, and I, I, I'm clear we can know this, they represent the essence of what he was praying because he prayed it three different times and it's recorded in Scripture. This is the heart of it. This is the essence of it. So they're important for us to pay attention to. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So let's focus on those words as he shows us how we can surrender ourselves to the Father as well. At times when we're pressed and when we're going through times that we would not necessarily choose for ourselves, how can we surrender to our Father so he can take us to the place he wants us to go? That's a hard thing for all of us, so let's pay attention. Uh, three things, I'll try to keep it short. We see from Jesus that surrendering begins with honesty. Honesty, that's the first thing I see here. Um, and true surrender, and remember, surrender is a positive thing, begins with honesty. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, it says here, all the disciples, but he separated Peter, James, and John. It tells us that and the others. And he, they were about a stone's throw away. That means they could still see him. They could still hear him, but he, they weren't right next to him. Uh, and uh, the Bible says in verse 41, he knelt down and prayed. Now, Mark's gospel says that Jesus began this prayer uh, prefaced what we see here by saying, Father, all things are possible for you. And then he said, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. And, and this portion of this prayer, we're going to stop there, I think you'll agree, as short as it is, is a prayer of complete, total, bare honesty before the Father. If you're willing, all things are possible, God. Uh, he acknowledges the Father's complete sovereignty and control. All things are possible for you. Father, I know you can do anything. Then he says, while I know you can do anything, I know you can remove this situation that I'm facing. I've obeyed you. I've done everything you've called me to do. And I know I'm coming to Jerusalem to die. He knew all those things. And then he prayed, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. 
You see, as the God-man, Jesus felt all the things that we humans feel. And he felt the weight of the suffering that he was about to bear that was about to come upon him in these hours ahead. Now, you may want to circle the word cup, if it's your own Bible, that is, because it's very significant. In the Old Testament, the cup was a symbol of God's judgment, his judgment on sin. Time and time again, it's used that way. In fact, many times in the Old Testament, the prophets talked about God pouring out the cup of his judgment. The cup was a representation of God's judgment and the suffering he would endure, and that's why he used this word, let this cup of judgment pass from me. He was saying, Father, there's a part of me, I think we would say the human part of him, there's a part of me that I don't want to experience all that I know I'm about to experience. He was talking about the judgment for sin that he was going to endure on the cross. Jesus knew all about the physical pain that he would experience on the cross. He knew about the agony of being stretched out. He knew about being nailed with his hands and his feet. He knew, and it was torture, but he knew the physical pain. But more than that, he knew the spiritual judgment for sin and the pain of that that he was about to bear for all of us in his own body. Because when Jesus died on the cross, what he experienced physically was just a fraction of what he was experiencing spiritually. In fact, the Bible says that God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5. He became a payment for my sin and a payment for your sin. Every sin that you can name, every sin that you can name, whether it seems like a big sin or a small sin, is against an infinite God. And whether we think it's big or small, it deserves eternal, infinite punishment. That's why hell is a place of eternal punishment. Uh, it's not because of how big or small we think our sins are. Okay, It's because when we sin, we sin against a holy, eternal God. And, then, and, and the punishment is eternal as well. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I mentioned that before, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion, you will have to pay for your own sins someday rather than Jesus paying the price for you. I hope that that won't happen. Hell is not a good place to end up for sure. That's an understatement, isn't it? Change that. Change that. You could change that. The door is open. You can come to him. Put your faith and trust in him. So I'm going to move on, though. You know, because the point here is this prayer. He knew perfectly as the Son of God that he was, what he was going to experience on the cross. So he prayed a very honest prayer. I hope you see that. He says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. And yet, without a breath of hesitation, he continues on and says, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. <clears throat> but what you and I need to see before that surrender part of it, he was completely honest with the Father first. Let this cup pass from me. I want you to think about yourself now. Think about you. When God puts something in front of you that he's calling you to do, and it's something you don't want necessarily to do, it's something that's hard for you to do, maybe it's something that's painful for you to do, maybe it's something that just sort of wrecks your plans about how you thought life was going to go for you. When that happens, uh, maybe it calls for you to forgive somebody you don't want to forgive, and you come before God, listen, you can be honest enough to tell him how you really feel about it when he's called you to do something you really don't want to do. This is important. Be honest enough to say, God, I don't want to do this. Because until you're honest with God, you're just playing games with God. If you pretend that everything's cool and you're doing this when you know in your heart that you don't really want to do it, you're not fooling God. You're maybe fooling yourself for a little while. 
Uh, and it's keeping you from real surrender. Maybe it's a sin you need to confess. Maybe it's just as simple as saying, God, I know you're asking me to do something, or I know that, that you've commanded something for me to do or to live by in your word, and I don't want to obey it. I don't want to obey it. Be honest with them. See, until you're honest with yourself about that, you can't be honest with God. And you're going to go nowhere. But when you or me, when we get bold-faced, honest with God, then surrender can come. When you've stopped playing games and you start to get honest with God, but you say, no, I can't do that. I can't tell God I don't want to do that. It seems so unspiritual. Listen, when you do that, you'll be just as unspiritual as Jesus was. Did everyone hear me say that? Does that sound right? No. But that's exactly what he did. Jesus is the Son of God. He, there was nothing lacking in him spiritually, and yet he came before God the Father and said, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. He didn't just say it one time or two times. He said it at least three times, and probably over and over each of those three, three times in prayer. Father, all things are passable for you. I know that. And if you're willing, you can remove this. I wish you would. But don't miss the next words. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Until you just get bold-faced, honest before God, you'll never come to the place where you can say like Jesus did, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Until you've told God what your will is, you can't surrender your will to God's will. And some of you know that's what you need to do. And so we see Jesus surrendering through honesty. Second thing we see here, Jesus surrendered through the pain, through the pain. And we're going to get to that, but there's a little respite here in verse 43. In verse 43, Luke shares something that the other two Gospels don't share about this account. It says, and there appeared to Jesus an angel from heaven strengthening him. I'm glad it's in there. We don't know exactly what the angel did to strengthen him, but here's what we do know. We know Jesus was going through an ultimate struggle for surrender, and he wasn't by himself when he did it. He wasn't by himself. I want to remind you, when you're going through that struggle to surrender, you're not by yourself. You may feel like you're by yourself. You may feel like no one understands. For Jesus, nobody else did understand, right? Peter, James, and John were right there. They didn't understand. They were taking a nap, actually. But you're not by yourself. An angel from the Lord came and strengthened him. Then in verse 44, it says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. You know, we tend to be drawn to that in Scripture, which seems strange and unusual. So I think what we do is we focus immediately on the great drops of blood. So let's begin there, because we're going to think about that anyway, even though the point here is really not about the blood or the drops, like drops of blood. It's more about the agony that caused the blood. But I'll get to that in just a minute. Let me just say this. Some interpreters believe that this means that the capillaries in Jesus' body began to burst and he was actually sweating uh, sweat and blood together. And there is a medical uh, reality behind that. There's a medical condition, and I can't say it, hematidrosis. That's probably wrong, but if, anyway, that's what some believe. I, I actually believe that the likelihood is just as the words actually say here, if you read it carefully, and it's found this way right back into the Greek original text. His sweat became like great drops of blood. I believe that Jesus was in such agony that he was sweating so profusely that it was like blood gushing from a wound. Any way you want to take it is fine because in either case, 
Luke's main purpose is to highlight the utter intensity of Jesus' emotional and physical trauma. He was in agony over the pain he knew he would endure suffering for our sins. But Jesus was willing to accept the pain and suffered through the pain to achieve the will of the Father, our redemption. Aren't you glad he did that? I am. And he was able to take every agonizing step all the way to the cross while his disciples, on the other hand, epitomized by Peter's threefold denial, which we'll read about soon and already read Jesus predicted. And as the heat gets turned up on all the apostles, as soon as Jesus was taken away and arrested and tried, everything else that was happening, for the most part, they all ran away. They ran away from Jesus. They fled. Because instead of surrendering through their agony, they surrendered to their agony. And they said, this is too much for us. We can't take it. This is too difficult. We're just going to check out. Let me illustrate what I'm, I'm trying to say here from this, this text. Uh, years ago, 1978, there was a world championship chess mass match played by two Russian grandmasters, Viktor Korchnoi and Ant Antoly Karpov. And, and these two guys were so good, and the, this was a, a, an international tournament, and they were playing for hours and hours, one tedious move after another, and they were both so good it didn't seem like either man, man was going to ever win this particular chess match. And so Karpov offered to Korchnoi, he said, why don't we just call it a tie? Nobody wins, nobody loses, and then we'll just continue on with the tournament because there's more than one match in a tournament. But here's the thing. Everyone knew from his, his history of uh, Korchnoi, Korchnoi never surrendered a game. There was, you could do that, by the way, in the rules. He, but he never called it a tie. But on that day, he looked back at his opponent, sort of leaned back in his chair, smiled a little bit, and said, OK, we'll call it a tie. And that's what they did. Well, tournament went on. After it was over, a reporter asked him, said, why did you agree this time to call it a tie? You never do that. And he said, and I quote, well, it was a long day, and I was very hungry. And I knew that they had made chicken for lunch. He said, I did not surrender to my opponent, but I did surrender to my appetite. <laughs> now, that's probably more humor and wit rather than his true reason, but it makes the point for us. So here's, here's the truth. When you surrender to your appetites, when you surrender to the easy path rather than being willing to accept the pain or the unknowns that come with following God's will, you lose. You actually surrender to the enemy when you did that. Because more than anything else, Satan wants to take us out of the game, right? He, he wants to take us out of the battle. He wants you to wave the white flag and say, it's over. You're not going to do what God wants you to do. But when you surrender to God and place yourself in his hands despite the pain, that is victory. Unlike any other surrender... Remember that, it, and, 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 and it means that you have come to understand, when you can do this, you've come to understand and come to align yourself with the reality of how this universe works that God made and, and what it is. The whole universe, us included, is governed by a sovereign God, in, and it's in his loving hands, the whole universe. And when you finally, and then time after time, surrender to his perfect will, you're, you're in a place where he can take you to where he wants you to be. That's victory. That's winning. Listen, I know that in this room, with the number of people we have, there must be people who are today struggling with this very thing. There's some area of your life where you simply need to stop saying yes to the people around you or yes to yourself and begin to say yes to Jesus. 
And when you surrender to him, you win. You win. Because when you surrender to him, you're surrendering to the one who you can trust completely. Because this whole universe is governed by him. He knows what he's doing. Now, I need to move on. I just need to pick up on one very obvious thing that I've kind of tiptoed around because I wanted it to be my last point. I didn't really go through this verse by verse as I often do. But let's get to it now. Surrender is empowered by prayer. Go back to verse 39. It says he was going to the garden as was his custom. His custom for what? It was his custom to pray. And then in verse 40 it says he tells his disciples something. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now you tell me. What did Jesus do three times in that garden? Simple, four letters. He prayed, right? He prayed. What did Peter and James and John do? They slept. In fact, they slept all three. All three times when Jesus came out of prayer, they were asleep, okay? You'll find that in Luke, I mean in Mark, but you won't find all of that here because this is a a compressed uh, account. After each of those times, they were sleeping. He found them asleep. He told them to pray for strength to resist temptation. They slept instead and temptation came and they couldn't resist it. Jesus prayed three times with honesty and received the strength he needed. Isn't it obvious the point we should get out of this? Prayer is necessary if we want to be empowered to stand up to the temptations and be able to surrender our will to his. We align ourselves to the God of the universe when we stay in a relationship and in communion and communication with him and prayer is the most direct means that we have of doing that. Peter found out all too well, as they all did, in the next few hours, how true that was. If you don't want to surrender to your appetites rather than to God, then cultivate a life of prayer. And you might be saying, I've tried and I've tried. Prayer is so hard. I'm so inconsistent. I I can relate to that. But don't give up. In fact, don't just do what you've been doing, if that's the case. Do something different. Maybe you need to join a group to help you to pray and pray together. Okay, You can join one of our daily prayer groups if you're available at mid noontime. Come and join us and pray with us. Even if you just listen, start praying with us. Or on Wednesday nights, we have a group for prayer. But I'll tell you, that's not the only groups you can do. Um, I, I, let me just ask you, I haven't asked anyone to respond to this ahead of time, but how many of you have found it's helpful to have a prayer partner, and so you do have a prayer partner, and on some regular basis, you get together to pray? Can you just raise your hand if that's the case? Two, I see hands. That's another way. It's it's a way to bolster our prayer life, okay? Do something, because three times Jesus surrenders his will to the Father in Father's in prayer, three times in prayer. If Jesus needed three times, I need 333 times. Do we get the message? Our ability to get on the pathway to victory in God's kingdom, the pathway of surrender that causes us not to lose but to win, will come as we cultivate a life of prayer. Will you do it? With that, we're going to conclude. Let's just sum up what we said. If you could put up that. Surrender begins with honesty. That's so important. That's a stumbling block for some of us. We're not honest. Surrender doesn't cave to but endures through pain. That kind of rhymes, doesn't it? Doesn't cave to but endures through. Maybe it'll help us to remember it through pain. And surrender is empowered by prayer. And surrendering is winning. Please remember that surrendering is winning when it's surrendering to the God of the universe. It's a sweet surrender. 
Brothers and sisters, you probably already know if there's some areas in your life that you've been refusing to surrender, thinking that perhaps that God can't give you victory without you being miserable in doing it. That's a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. That's Satan's lie. Don't believe it anymore. It's time now. And I'll pray for you that you'll surrender. We'll have a time of prayer here if you'd like to come and just begin to share that with someone and we'll pray with you. And as we close, and Jose, you're welcome to come up now if you want. Do you have a relationship with God? That's where it starts. The God of the universe. That's what we've been talking about. You know, it starts there, and it starts really kind of in the same way that we've been talking about for those who do have that relationship. It starts with surrender. You know, when we put ourselves under the guidance and control of God, then he can guide us. But there's a roadblock, of course. The Bible says the roadblock is sin. We looked at that at the Lord's Supper. The roadblock we can't remove, and only God can remove, and God did remove when he went to the cross. That's why God in his amazing love has accomplished what he's accomplished for us at the cross. He sent his son to die in our place to pay for our sin debt so that we would not have to pay our sin debt to give us his righteousness so that we can be in a relationship with a holy God. That's the gospel. It's so wonderful. So what must happen to get it? We, we, just, we have to acknowledge our need as sinners and then be willing to turn to him and turn to Jesus Christ and trust him as our Lord and our Savior. Will you do that? You can do that today. You can move from being on a road to hell to being on a pathway to heaven with a God that's ready to help you every step of the way. Here's a prayer we'll put up. You can, this is one way you can express those truths to God. Prayer is a connect, it's the quickest connection to God. Talk to God about it. Jesus, he's God. I believe that you are God's son. And I trust you alone as my Lord and my Savior. I turn from my sin and I receive your gift of forgiveness. Amen. If you express that prayer to God, mean it. He hears it. He tells us that. And he'll forgive you, put you on a new path. Hope you'll do that even as we close. I'm going to ask us all to stand. We're going to be dismissed. And if, uh, as we, is our normal practice, we have a place of, to come forward to commit ourselves to, to the Lord. Uh, maybe as a believer, there's just an area that you've been stuck. You need to turn over and let God be in control. And you're ready to do that. And maybe you want some help praying for it. Then come and Bob, Bob's up here in the front. And I'll be up in the front in just a moment. And I'd uh, love to receive you. Or if you're here and you want to express my faith in Jesus. I'm a new believer. I'm trusting that I prayed that prayer. I mean it. I just want to declare my faith. God loves it when we do that. Come and share that with me or Bob or whoever's up here. And, and uh, maybe it's for some other public decision like membership or baptism. Love to be able to commit those things in prayer with you as you come forward today. As I lead us in our closing song. Breathe on me, breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what you love and do what you would do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with you I will, one will, to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of the living. 
God Fall on me Holy Spirit Fall Fill me up With your presence Let your love consume me Lord, breathe on me. Man, as we are dismissed, please check out the table for the first responders. Brad is already out there. We really could use your help to make it a, a really great outreach. Um, as well, at 4.30, reminder of our business meeting, and tonight at 6, we have our evening service. We're going to be looking at one of the commandments that makes us a little bit uncomfortable, the one that talks about taking the Lord's name in vain. And we're going, I'm glad I don't do that. Well, come and listen, because we have to be careful what we're saying when we say that. And that's tonight at 6. May the Lord bless you. You are dismissed. Sorry, sorry. I'm trying to get oh, that's okay. Thanks, Dan. Hey, Rob. Thanks.